tell me everything you know about hepatitis C. About hepatitis C? Basically, what I read in the paper, not that much. You can get it through bad water in different countries. I think that it's uh, uh, there's particular places in the world when that's a big issue, but uh, for what I understand, not, not as much in Canada. <laughs> I can't tell you anything. Do you, um, have you ever heard of hepatitis C? No. I know it's contagious. I know there's, there's hepatitis A, B, C you don't hear too often about. A lot of people, um, like when they go to the Caribbean, they get it. Yeah, I, I, I know there's a needle you can take for it, isn't it? Hepatitis C. Uh, I actually don't know much. I think they give you shots for it in high school. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I think I got a needle for it. But you can be vaccinated against it. Yeah, I think I had like a two or three weeks ago. The issue of hepatitis C. I didn't know it was an issue. The difficulty with hepatitis C is that there's no symptoms until it's too late. It's kind of like you're walking towards a cliff. You know, you're looking out in the horizon, you can't see that, you, you don't appreciate that the ground is going to give out in front of you. And you feel perfectly fine as you walk towards that cliff. If you look at lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, steady decline. Liver cancer, going up. And what's that from? It's from undiagnosed hepatitis C. There are a very large number of people who have chronic hepatitis C and if we're talking about several hundred thousand people who are going to suffer this fate over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, we're really talking about an enormous health burden. With hepatitis C what we're looking at is the tip of the iceberg. What is coming to the forefront now is the base of that iceberg, and it is huge. I would argue that maybe the priorities of some of our public health agencies have failed. In actual fact, the death rate from hepatitis C in Ontario and in Canada exceeds the death rate from HIV, and the crossover occurred a few years ago. This has the potential to actually cost a huge amount of money and devastate our healthcare system if we don't proactively do something about it now. We have lots and lots of undiagnosed individuals and, and uh, we have to find them because they're the ones walking towards that cliff, right? In 1990, I had, um, I was feeling extra tired, I thought, but I was teaching full time and I was um, running the strawberry business. What we did in our spare time years ago. There's a stone house up the road that's absolutely gorgeous and my good friend lived there. And I said, if you ever, ever sell that house, I want to first dibs on buying it. And the people for the mortgage did an independent medical test. So they sent this little nurse to the house and did all this stuff with machines and stuff. And three weeks later, Bill got a call saying, you're fine, your wife isn't. My liver was two thirds gone. If we had not bought the stone house, I would be dead. The universe works in curious ways. Five minutes, Mr. McDonald, five minutes. My wife had suggested that I go for a checkup because I was exhibiting now in hindsight uh, symptoms of the hep C by being lethargic, slurring my words, dropping glasses, tripping over stuff, very uncharacteristic for me. They said, yeah, your liver is really bad. 
you have two and a half months to live it without a, a transplant. And they were really pushing it too. And I, Cause I would say, well, I'm looking into this alternative medicine right now. I've got this acupuncturist and this herbal a holistic guy and nothing will help you. You have to get a transplant. You know, what are you on commission? You know, they were really pushing. That to me was always the last thing I wanted to do was to get a transplant. Yeah. I was hoping for another way to get around it, but unfortunately for me, it, it didn't uh, pan out any other way. And fortunately for me again, the transplant worked. Even two months ago, my voice was like, <laughs> like the Godfather. Uh, why do you come to me with that? I, I thought it was over. I thought I would never go back on the stage. It's a, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here tonight. It's a privilege and honor to be anywhere right now. You just missed a beautiful stellar sea lion, man. Oh, He's gonna come up again. Yeah, there. Wow. Yeah, you can tell by the nose. It was in 1996, somewhere around there. I can't remember, 96 or 95. I was uh, finishing up my doctorate at McGill and uh, participating in a lot of sports and teaching at two universities, you know, doing the usual PhD stuff that makes marriages fall apart, you know? And uh, I started feeling really weird, uh, getting very dizzy and disoriented. In fact, I just about fainted in one of my classes. My doctor, because uh, her first recommendation is, oh, you're under a lot of stress. I said, of course, tell me something new, you know? But eventually they did blood tests, they didn't do them right away. And then she called me and said, I have some bad news for you. And uh, she told me I had hep C, but I was actually kind of happy to know that I had something because it was explained, I didn't know what hep C was, but I knew, ah, right, I'm not imagining this. This is something there. In 2004, late uh, 2004, I got what I thought was the flu. And it just progressed, and, and I went to the doctor, and they said, oh, you've got the flu, and go home and get plenty of bed rest and drink plenty of liquids. And I uh, got to the point where I couldn't even keep food down. I was vomiting what I know now is blood. My general practitioner at that point just checked every box there was on because he didn't know what was wrong with me. And I uh, got a phone call two days later, your hepatitis C positive, and I went, what the heck is hepatitis C? <laughs> Never heard of it. This is some foreign, foreign thing that other people get. You know? <laughs> How's your liver right now? It's cirrhotic. It's, it's highly, I, I'm in stage liver disease. My liver was two thirds gone and no indication that there was anything wrong with me. Some people don't get sick. They don't get sick until their liver is, it dies, until there's liver death or, or cancer is found. One of the things I often say to my patients is the best thing about liver disease is it has no symptoms, and the worst thing about liver disease is it has no symptoms. And this may sound silly, but the reason it, this is a challenge is that many people with hepatitis C have no symptoms at all from their infection. Some people do have symptoms, but many people have no symptoms. And so the problem with that is that a, they don't realize that they have the infection. They may know nothing about it beforehand. And B, their doctors often don't realize they have the infection because they feel perfectly well. So they don't go complain to a doctor that they've got symptom X, Y, or Z. They feel fine. Statistics Canada actually very recently, just a few weeks ago, came out with a study. They took people, they went up to the, you know, I walk up to you and I say, do you have hepatitis C infection? And you say yes, no, or I don't know. And then I take your blood and I test it for hepatitis C. And I find out. And of the people that they found that were infected with hepatitis C virus in Canada, 70% had no idea that they were infected. My name is uh, Sergeant Lance Gibson. Uh, I've been in the military for 30 years. I'm married, I have two children. I'm a recent uh, liver transplant recipient. I was first diagnosed in 2008 and uh, I have hepatitis C.
uh, everything was normal for me. I had no idea that I was carrying uh, a deadly virus. Uh, and then in December 19th, uh, 2008, at about 9.30 in the morning, I got called into the doctor's office. And uh, the doctor said to me, your platelet count is really, really low. Um, are you feeling okay? And I said, I'm feeling fine. I'm in, I think I'm in the best shape of my life. Uh, for the first time, everything is going really well for me. Finally, I got to the point where I said, where are you going with this? What's going on? And they said, well, Sergeant Gibson, you have hepatitis C. My life changed as soon as I found that out. Um, when I say I was devastated, I was blown away. When I was all going through my, my treatment process, I had to redo my will, right? Just in case the inevitable happened. And one of my uh, requests in my will is to have my ashes spread at this uh, cenotaph. Uh, one of my very first meetings with uh, Dr. Jordan Feld, who is my uh, liver clinician, I said to him, uh, Dr. Feld, uh, I need you to do one thing for me and one thing only. Do not sugarcoat anything. If I'm gonna die next year, I want you to tell me that, that I'm gonna die next year. And he said, I, I would estimate that if you don't get a liver transplant in five years, uh, you, you could die. So when I got my liver transplant, I was in my fourth year from that first initial meeting. So uh, my time was almost up. In Canada, it's a sad fact that more people die waiting for a liver transplant than get a liver transplant on that list. And that's just the people who make it on the list. It, it ignores all the people who never make it on the list because they're diagnosed at too late a stage or, you know, for whatever reason, they, they don't, aren't even eligible for a liver transplant. Well, when I came out of my coma, I was so sick that the, the liver had, it was liver death that was killing me. Um, I was on the transplant list. I was on emergency with the beeper and everything else. Now, um, it's her, well, look, you know, she's done okay, you know. She's holding her own. I'm not on the transplant list because I'm too healthy. <laughs> so I'm a bad girl for taking care of myself, I guess. All right. My name is Karen Falski. I am, um, I'm 57 years old. I am now retired due to my illness. Um, I've had hepatitis C probably, I believe, for 42 years now. So I've been through treatment twice. I'm on my third course right now. Um, my first treatment was in 95. Was on my drugs for three months. Really had to stop. It just made me so full of anxiety. I couldn't walk out of my house. I needed to see my doctor. I couldn't leave. I had incredible pain um, in my body. After three months, all I wanted to do is get a chainsaw, cut my leg off. Like that's how mentally uh, involved it was for me and the pain, it was so great. So when I climbed, somehow I dragged, dragged myself to the doctor and they took one look at me and said, that's it, you're off of it. The treatment's not doing anything for you. It's just making you miserable, giving you all kinds of side effects that are really not good for you, so let's stop. You know, my liver, I've had cirrhosis for over a couple of years now. And basically my doctors tell me, this is it. I have no other option. We've got to make this treatment work because after this, probably facing a liver transplant and who knows how soon, how far away. Will I be too old? Will you give it to that 21 year old instead of me? And you probably will. When you go through all this for so long, and you go through treatment and you fail twice and then you have something else and now you're so low at, at where you can be health wise if you know what I'm saying it can really play heavily on your on your head on your emotions uh, totally hi it's Chantal calling again we're specialized nurses that work in hepatology here at Procuro Clinic. Um, we focus in the areas of standard of care treatment as well as uh, clinical research. All nurses, run by a nurse, 
for nurses. <laughs> You know, we're on the phone daily with some patients, just trying to get them through their symptoms emotionally, physically, financially. Um, it is really a, a team effort to get them through the therapy. The role of the nurses here for people dealing with hepatitis C is huge. They support me greatly. I think it's extremely critical that they are here because they are also giving you more information than your specialist would have because he may not have the time to give you the information, follow you as closely. Nurses have time. That's the beauty of it is that our door is open. We will make room for those patients. Doctors, you know, they've got a busy schedule. They're, they're booked nine to five, whatnot. They're slotted in for 15 minutes. We'll see patients for an hour, sometimes more just dealing with their problems, trying to find a solution, um, and, and just, you know, trying to make it work. To this point, treatment has been fairly, it's very harsh. It's not an easy therapy to go through. That's why um, we brought forward hepatitis support nursing in order to be able to, in, instead of being handed a box of medication, here you are, go home and deal with it. Um, to be able to give patients the support to get through is absolutely phenomenal. My name is Ray Collins. Um, I was born December 15, 1960. I just turned uh, 53 years of age uh, on Sunday. Um, I've uh, was diagnosed in uh, August 2009 uh, with Hep C uh, to find out that uh, I had been carrying it around since the 80s because of uh, my intravenous use uh, with cocaine. I'm currently uh, living uh, at a clean and sober home uh, for people that are in recovery, guys. We all have responsibilities to uh, clean up after ourselves. Some guys do, some guys don't, but that's all part of community living. Just a little over four years clean and sober, and uh, that's after being out there destroying my life on a daily basis for uh, over three decades. Just uh, living life again. For a lot of us, uh, living life for the first time. There's a lot of people out there that have it and they're afraid to, to deal with it. They've heard horror stories about uh, being on the treatment and that. I know one thing for sure, that when I was in my active addiction, if I would have found out I had hep C, I never would have did the treatment. Never would have done it. Because it would have interfered with my using. Well, what I realized, you know, as in my recovery, as I did with my hep C doing my treatment, is that uh, I didn't have to do it alone. And uh, I think that's what a lot of us experience through, through life, is that, you know, we're afraid to ask for help. And when we do ask for help, uh, we realize that uh, people are willing to uh, bend over backwards to uh, support us in any way that they can. When I first started doing the treatment and I was uh, feeling very uh, down and out that uh, there was someone there telling me that uh, it was going to be okay, just keep moving forward. And that's what I kept doing, kept moving forward. Patients need contact. They need contact. They need to be motivated to stay on treatment. They need to be, they need that relationship building. Especially people who have addiction issues, they recognize that they need the support and they're, they're going to need the support to get them through treatment.
Hey, James. Are you coming to the clinic today? Uh, yeah. The reason why we down here in Pender, in the downtown east side, see hep C treatment as really powerful is because it doesn't just affect the liver, but it can really put people on a different path. At 10 o'clock on Friday mornings, uh, the doors open, uh, the sign-in sheets filled out at the front, and uh, the hep C patients just come flooding in, and we, uh, we conduct wow, group. One of my poster children, when I first got started here, he now has RRSPs in the bank. He was homeless through parts of his treatment. Because I would be dead by now. My hep C counts went so high. Uh, it's either rigor mortis or do the treatment. That's She's it. the best. Yeah. I mean, I would never have trusted the treatment. It wasn't. She looked in my eyes and I trusted her. Mm -hmm. Really, and uh, I'm so happy I did. And I owe my life to her and I love her dearly and I'm so grateful. This clinic is probably one of the most important clinics in Canada because here they've saved lives and they've saved a lot of lives. I'm not the only one. I've met many people that did the treatment and got their life back. So actually, John, since you're here, it would be good to check in with you because you finished treatment how long ago? Oh, it's been, what, two weeks? Four weeks. Yeah, no, it's a little bit longer. I would have said more, but I don't remember. About a month and a half now? Uh, my name is John. Um, I'm 36 years old. I've been uh, struggling with um, addiction my whole life, pretty much, since an early age. and. Uh, I came up here, um, I just got lost in addiction and uh, eventually I got to a place where I, I felt like I couldn't go on any further and uh, I was able to uh, reach out and accept some help for once. So you've got 14 months clean? Correct. Done your hep C treatment? Correct. Where's life going at this point? I, not, not that you have to have it all planned out, but I'm just no. curious how you're feeling about the future. And I, I, I have taken some steps towards that, right? Um, I'm presently uh, attending workshops and considering going back to school. Wow, I didn't know. My, my daughter's mother was also a heroin addict too, right? So um, it's, we've, we've both had to battle with this addiction and and um, yeah, it, it hasn't been an easy process, but uh, we we both live different today. There's a there's a huge difference. I feel like my life is just beginning again, right? Like okay. as of before, it felt like I was kind of like frozen in time, and, and I wasn't able to to move forward until this obstacle got out of the way. That's somebody's loved one, that's somebody's son, that's somebody's father, and he deserves just as much attention as anybody else. Yeah, and she's, she's what, six now? She's six, yeah, she's in grade one, and you know, she, she's my world. Yeah. I love her to pieces, and uh, it's great. she's uh, taken up ice skating, and <laughs> you know, uh, so you're like teaching her how to skate? Yeah, yeah, cool. it's, it's great. It's cool. such a great freedom. I, I'm in such a peaceful state nowadays. I mean, uh, yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I have a 17-year-old daughter and I I keep her busy in sports. And, and uh, wow. she's awesome. She's a straight-A student. She's really a great kid. So yeah, I devote myself to being a parent mostly. The attention that they get from their healthcare providers, from seeing nurses one-on-one -on -one every week, from um, meeting other people in group who have similar, have something going on that, that's, that's similar, that they can share, they can find housing through each other, they can um, support each other, that can make, move people towards a whole new, new option, or many options in life that they didn't even think were attainable total and complete change like to life like I've gone in honest all, all honesty I've never functioned like at this level even though just it's been for like less than a week I've never had this kind of energy in my life so it's a total turnaround in the past year I mean I'm my son 
is back in my life. I have my son two days a week, and uh, you know, for the first time in my life, I'm a support and an aid to my family rather than a burden, and um, and to my community. And you know, I do I do service around the community and volunteer work, and you know, that's all brand new stuff for me. And this is part of the reason that that stuff's possible, right? So, yeah. We have a good medical system in Canada, maybe not the best, but the fact that this clinic exists, I'm grateful. The stigma is about plain and simple injection drug use. It's not about hepatitis C as a disease, as a virus. It's about hep C because injection drug users get that disease. You know, the, the picture of someone who typically has hepatitis C as a, you know, an injection drug user who's maybe a, a substance abuser of other, other things is to me is a it's it's not it doesn't reflect what I see uh, day to day uh, I see people who are you know very well accomplished if I said their names you would instantly know who they are that that come to see us because they have hepatitis C and then I of course see individuals who are of very low socioeconomic status but it's the full spectrum it's the full spectrum of ethnicity and ancestry as well I went to a benefit one time and there was this long list of famous people who have hep C, but they haven't come out. And I, and I asked the person, I said, well, why do these people not come out? And uh, she said, well, there's that, still that stigma and right away when you mention liver disease, people assume you're an alcoholic. So for years I lived in, in fear of telling people what was wrong with me because I thought, I don't want to get stigmatized. I can't handle that. I need someone to say, how are you? Not what, what did that to you or how did you get it? One of my nursing friends that I used to work with was asking me what I was doing, where I was going. And when I told her I was working here with hep C and hepatology, she asked me, why would I want to work with hep C? In her mind, it was just addicts and, and druggies and, and, and whatnot. It's um, very much perceived as a dirty disease. Hepatitis C is not a dirty word. It's, it doesn't come from dirt. It has nothing to do with being dirty. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, people in parliament, I mean, every walks of life get hepatitis C. Whenever you have a, a disease, no matter what it is, where amongst the provider population, there is a lack of awareness about how it's transmitted, how people got it, uh, what populations it targets. You know, I think providers have this idea in their head of who these people are. Uh, instantly individuals get treated differently. Uh, you know, 40% of people in Canada who acquired hep C here have no risk factors, actually. They can't even identify where they got it. They're not ex-junkies or drug users. Um, but they're being treated as such, and they tell me about those experiences all the time. Hey, morning, it's Sergeant Gibson. Um, how'd that test go this morning? Well, I went through a number of medical staff and doctors Again, trying to convince them. I had no involvement with drugs. I had no involvement with uh, outside sexual partners other than my wife. Um, I don't drink. I don't smoke. Uh, I'm, a, I'm as clean as you get. And, uh, uh, and it took some serious uh, you know, emphasis on my part to say, enough is enough. I, I've told you, I've had nothing to do with that. They didn't quite believe me when I said, no, I'm not involved in that culture. I have never had anything to do with that culture. People make judgments and, uh, you know, I'm right in there making judgments too. I just try to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Trying to get the awareness and the education out to the profession, the healthcare professionals, I did, um, as I mentioned, grand rounds down in Duncan. And I brought forward 
what it means for patients to access treatment. And I had two physicians come up to me following the session saying that they found that they had a really hard time even thinking about putting any funding into hep C because, quote, these people or those people have done it to themselves. And these were physicians, general practitioner physicians. Those people have done it to themselves. And there's so many people that, you know, they got it through a blood transfusion or they don't even know where they got it. But, or if, they, if it was, you know, maybe IV drugs that they experimented with back in the 60s and they never looked back. They even forgot that they had ever done that until, you know, they, they, they got the diagnosis and they had to go and explore where it might have come from. It's just... Active injection drug users account for a very small proportion of all people with hepatitis C. The vast majority have either never used drugs, or if they have, they used it many years ago back in the 60s and 70s, and have since stopped using, they were never addicted, or if they were, only for a short period of time, and they've now gone on to become otherwise responsible citizens. But this is in their past, and I, you know, I don't think that there should be any stigma attached to that, to something that you did when you were in your late teens or early 20s and you're now in your 40s or 50s. Hi, I'm Cheryl Wrights. I'm 65. Um, I'm a grandmother of three, hopefully four, um, soon. People came to People came to say goodbye to me. I mean, they thought my, my, my brothers, my sisters, my kids, my, my oldest son, he came from Germany. I mean, they thought I was dying. I did too. I, one week of my life, I probably did some recreational things that I oughtn't. So, uh, does, that, does that make me a, a leper? I don't know. <laughs> I was uh, 15 and I uh, had a couple of drinks and was talked into using uh, IV drugs. Um, my father died at, uh, when I was 13, so I was pretty, pretty vulnerable uh, position. So uh, basically, I'm pretty sure that that's the day, day it happened. The biggest problem is the ostracization, and you have to defend yourself from, uh, from people's attitudes. The first time I walked into a specialist's office, uh, she complained bitterly about having to support my medical expenses. After driving 500 miles to get to the doctor's office, she, uh, she snapped at me because that was going to cost a lot to the medical system. If you look at diabetes, is it not because a good proportion of our population are obese because of their behavioral habits with the intake of food? When they're shoveling Twinkies down their faces and, you know, they drink pop for breakfast? Well, do we not deserve to treat those patients? Look at um, lung cancers. The, those patients, d have they done it to themselves by the intake and the use of cigarettes? It's the lack of knowledge about the actual transmission of the disease that still is very prevalent today that keeps that stigma going and puts us the barriers to care for patients. Do you have any idea how people catch hepatitis C? Uh, they seem to get it from touching and eating things. Um, chapstick, drinks, or even through the air. You know, people touch food or something, their hand is not clean, you know, sanitary. I know it's, is it like a genit genital illness or? Could be spread um, uh, by exchanging of um, saliva. Um, wow, I've got to go back. Just a minute. Yes. Bodily contact. Yeah. Hepatitis C is not transmitted by casual contact. 
this is trans blood to blood transmission. They're confusing hepatitis A and they're confusing hepatitis B and so on. Hepatitis A is spread by uh, uh, fecal oral transmission. So contaminated food essentially. And that's where the issue comes about making, preparing food. Hep C, it's not an issue. You do not transmit disease that way. Anybody can contract hepatitis C unknowingly uh, through something innocent as, you know, getting a, a tattoo or getting a, a needle or any type of blood products. Everybody has minor surgeries in their life uh, and they never think twice about, you know, where did that blood come from? There was a lot of publicity in Canada made around the so-called tainted blood scandal where people were transfused blood that wasn't screened for hepatitis C very early after the discovery of the virus. But anyone that received a blood transfusion in Canada before 1992 was at risk for hepatitis C because the blood wasn't screened. So some people don't even remember getting a blood transfusion many, many years ago. Someone might have had a blood transfusion during childbirth 30 years ago and not remember that they had that done. or maybe remember but not have thought it was important, that person may be a middle-aged woman now who has chronic hepatitis C and has no idea. Someone may have used injection drugs even just once in their lifetime when they were experimenting in the 70s. That person might have hepatitis C infection. It's intranasal cocaine, people don't usually think of that as a risk factor, but sharing the straws that gets little flecks of blood, that's one of the roots of transmission and that's a much more commonly used drug than some of the harder drugs like heroin. So somebody with hep C, bloody nose, here's a straw, hey, who's next? Hey, welcome to the club. You got cut in your nose? Hey, welcome to the club, <laughs> you know, the hep C club. And then in Canada, because we have such a huge multinational mixed ethnic population, many people contracted hepatitis C prior to coming to Canada um, in their countries of origin through no fault of their own because in many countries in the past and in some countries still currently, uh, they're use, reusing medical equipment that hasn't been properly sterilized. My name is Daniel Armanto. I'm 22 years old. I'm from Iraq, and I'm sitting with my family and with my two sisters. Um, my my sister is Dina, and my sister Lena. I have a kidney a kidney kidney problem, kidney failure. Um, uh, I got this problem when uh, I was 13 years old. I had a transplant in uh, 2004, but uh, in 2006, uh, um, the kidney stopped again. In 2007, I started dialysis, and the dialysis over there wasn't very clean. I met Daniel in 2011 when he was referred by his kidney doctor because he was newly integrated into our hemodialysis program. And when patients join our hemodialysis program, they're screened and checked for all sorts of diseases, other bloodborne pathogens such as hepatitis B and HIV. And that's when Daniel's hepatitis C infection came to light within our clinic. Thanks for coming again today. And to the best of anybody's ability to tell, we believe that he contracted hepatitis C in a hemodialysis unit in the Middle East after his kidney transplant failed. They told me like I have hepatitis C. I told them, what, what, what's the hepatitis what does that C? Mean, what know? does that mean? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. For yeah, what is hepatitis C? Uh, it's like I thought it's like a, a little kind bit of like so, flu virus. No, no, kind of like an infection, and that's it. Yeah, like like uh, flu virus, you yeah, know, like normal virus, you know. This is going to give us hopefully a, a more accurate score of what's going on with with any degree of damage to your liver. Okay, why don't you lie back for me? Good. We'll take a few measurements and the computer will do all the calculations and take an average and let us know how your liver is making out, okay? Yeah. He's gone through so much in his life. I mean, the war, um, a kidney, a failed kidney transplant, dialysis, contracting hepatitis, trying to get treated for hepatitis, the treatment not working, and now presently being out of options 
for the treatment of his hep C, which is to a degree also going to affect his transplantability with respect to getting another kidney. Okay, you're all set there. You can sit up. And maybe we can walk over to my office and uh, have a chat about that, okay? One thing that I could say is it doesn't seem like your liver has progressed in terms of damage very fast since the last time we checked you. But at the same time, there has been a little bit of progression and I don't want to wait too much longer before we come up with a treatment strategy that's going to work for you. The hepatitis C is holding him back, you know. He needs to work, he needs to do something, he needs yeah. to see his, uh, let's say, target, you know, like life target. He's my only brother, you know. I just have this brother, so I need to see him happy, to see him free. She need to dance in my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's silly. <laughs> I'm lucky, actually. I'm you lucky. Got lucky. I'm yeah, lucky when uh, when uh, the Canada government accepted me here. I'm lucky. And we thank God for everything that you know we have here in this. Uh, you know, we're so proud for great that. country. There is magnitudes of difference in awareness when you look at HIV versus hepatitis C in Canada. If you look at hepatitis C, I mean, hepatitis C was discovered around the same time as HIV. Uh, it was always recognized as a huge problem. I mean, today is probably 10 times as important a problem from a public health impact perspective as HIV, but it never had that grassroots movement. When I, when I talk about this to groups, I show a slide and I have a picture of the HIV lobby and it's a picture of the million person march on Washington. And then I have a picture of the HCV lobby and it's two guys lying on a dock in Northern Ontario drinking a beer. And I, I, unfortunately, I, that is the reality that the hepatitis C lobby people with this infection often are marginalized and they're not a group that has been politically vocal. You gotta really hand it to like the gay lobby and what they did with AIDS. They were already organized, they were a community, and what did they have to lose? Nothing, they were dying. There is the empathy factor, and there's certainly we saw terrible photos of, of men and women dying and looking very ill, and we saw them die, in front of our eyes on, on TV, on pictures and newspapers and magazines, and you saw how, how ill they were. We're not seeing that with hepatitis C, and so people just don't have a sense of really what's going on there. The thing that has always, I think, contributed to the under-recognition of how important a public health problem with hepatitis C is that you know, people don't, when, they, when you fill out a death certificate for someone who's died of, of hepatitis C, you don't write, their cause of death is hepatitis C. The cause of death is liver cancer, liver failure, uh, you know, kidney failure as a result of the, the liver disease. There was a, a big study in Ontario, the Ontario Burden of Infectious Disease Study, uh, that looked in a systematic way at how much economic loss and how much health loss uh, and productivity loss is occurring from the various infectious diseases, so HIV, pneumonia, influenza, you know, uh, hepatitis B, uh, all those diseases that we hear a lot about, uh, C. difficile, for example. And when they did the analysis, initially hepatitis C was actually pretty low. It was pointed out to them that you're, you're, if you don't account for all the people who are dying of liver cancers and are getting transplants from hepatitis C, you're actually under, vastly underestimating the impact and the burden of the illness. And that's what's been going on for years. So when they redid the analysis, all of a sudden hepatitis C jumped to the top and it's like at the top by a mile. Like if you, you know, if you think about like a 100 meter race at the Olympics, I mean, people are winning by 0 0.01 seconds. This is like someone won a 100 meter race by like three seconds. I mean, it's that far ahead of all the other, all the other problems. It is really, uh, it, it's a hugely important health problem. The people dying of, of Hep C has sur well surpassed the people who have ever died of AIDS. But it's not talked about. So what happens? You don't make a lot of noise, you're not the, the squeaky wheel, you don't get the oil and they don't get the funds. 
and that's why we're seeing hepatitis C topping the list of years of life lost in Ontario. It's because we're under-treating this disease. Uh, certainly the Government of Canada thinks hepatitis C is a very important health issue. And, and to show that, uh, we've invested uh, quite a bit of money, over $9 million annually. I'm curious uh, what was spent on HIV programs of a similar nature. Uh, the number, uh, the, the figure we use for, for HIV is, is, uh, is a bit more. It's, uh, it's in a neighborhood uh, of uh, over $70 million. The amount of research dollars gone into hepatitis C is a, probably about $90 million over the last number of years. The equivalent for HIV is over $500 million. I would argue that maybe the priorities of some of our public health agencies have failed. From a political point of view, you know, the the Canadian government has only been embarrassed by hepatitis C. When you look at the tainted blood scandal, the Creever Commission, it's never had a success in hepatitis C. You know, they must look at it and just say, "What? Are, we're just going to get embarrassed again." Like, I, I wish that wasn't true, but I think that might be why some of the really the people who could, folk, who could direct focused efforts in this disease might not be doing so. Many countries in the world have a. Uh, a, a plan, a national strategy for either viral hepatitis in general or for hepatitis C specifically. The United States has one, Australia has one, France has one, a number of other European countries have them, Canada does not. So I, I think the biggest problem from my mind is sort of a lack of integration across the country to really understand the severity and I guess degree of the epidemic. Do you consider hep C to be an epidemic? It all depends, you know, in terms of uh, when you say uh, epidemic and so on, there's a very technical uh, definition for that. Certainly, uh, I would recognize that hepatitis C is an important health problem in Canada, uh, along with lots of other infectious diseases, and I think that uh, the way to deal with hepatitis C is to make sure it's part of an integrated approach so that we deal with it, as well as all the other related infections in a comprehensive manner. My name's Ian Reich, I'm the community health nurse at Chippewasanewash First Nation, uh, which is a small First Nation community on the Bruce Peninsula. I love it, I love the people, I love the community, and I love the work. Yeah, and in our community, there's about 750 people um, year-round that, that live here, and of those, we know of approximately 20 people uh, that do have hepatitis C. But saying that, uh, there's an unknown number um, of un undiagnosed or people that are unwilling to sort of come forward with their diagnosis. Bill, um, I'm 57 going on, 58 years old. Feel like 105. <laughs> Been a busy life. On First Nations, there's a high percentage of everything. You know, unemployment, housing, uh, lack of housing, uh, you know, education. Um, just a high percentage of everything. So it wouldn't surprise me that there's a high percentage of hepatitis C. Uh, just kind of goes with the territory, so to speak. It's a huge socioeconomic issue. Um, when, when people are more concerned about, you know, putting clothes on, on their kids' backs and providing food, the other stuff kind of takes a back seat. To expect a community to work off of such little funding and function the way that the general population functions just really doesn't make sense. And then when you go into the history of things, you start digging up things like residential schools that basically um, prevented the culture and these communities from, from thriving. Well, actually, I have uh, Crohn's colitis, and we're doing some blood tests, and that's one of the things. We're doing a, um, a med change, and the other meds were going to be hard on my liver. So we wound up uh, checking for hepatitis C and uh, found out that I did have it. 
I had no idea. You gotta be tough to do the treatment. You, you really gotta want it. And I was asked a few times by the doctor, you better be serious, because we're not gonna initiate this treatment. It's expensive. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll follow through. I'm stubborn. <laughs> I love life, you know what I mean? If you have it, you have it. I mean, you know, why be shy about it? But they never had Facebook in the day. But I wouldn't go on Facebook and say, you know, I've got hepatitis C. Anybody want to chat about it? <laughs> no, I wouldn't go that far, you know. It is not something to be embarrassed about. It is something that you need to speak about. You need to talk to your physician um, and your nurses and your, your health centers. You need to talk to them about it. And also, you know, if culture is important, you need to take that cultural approach too. But please don't ignore the, the, the medical approach because you can be cured. What well, we can now say is we can cure a chronic disease. First time ever we've been able to say that. Just to put it in context, there are not other chronic viral infections that we're able to cure. No one's been cured of HIV. Hepatitis B can be controlled but not cured. This is a curable infection. There is nothing better than curing someone of a condition. Like, you, we almost very, never do that in medicine. Right? Like, I mean, other than like strep throat, like what else do we cure? <laughs> Satisfaction of being able to tell a patient that they are cured just makes every hardship that I go through with patients and every um, barrier that we come forward in being able to access patients to care and treatment, it just makes it so worthwhile. I've been cured. I've been cured of hepatitis C. Um, so you're now you're, you're negative. Since then, December. Right? Since Please. December. Am I negative? Yeah, I guess I am. You're so negative. I'm so negative. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm a hepatitis C survivor. Maybe I should stop saying I'm hepatitis C positive. Start saying I'm a hepatitis C survivor because it's still with me. It's not. It's, it'll never go away. The, just the fact of having had it, and it's the fact that my I, I still have lots of liver damage, so, yeah. I just finished uh, nine months of treatment. It was my second time around, and uh, so far it looks like uh, it might have worked. I still have to go through the, the treatment process to get rid of the virus. And I know that the virus will be eradicated. It, for me, it's just a matter of time. Um, and thankfully, because of that transplant, it's given me that extra time uh, to be cured. Say you go through uh, the treatment and they say, guess what? You no longer have hepatitis C. What would you do? <laughs> the best. It's like... Um, dream comes true. Yeah. yeah. It's like a dream come true. I'm like, maybe it, maybe I'm going to lose my heart from the <laughs> happiness. <laughs> yeah. I have a funny little saying to my patients that when I can phone them and tell them that they're cured, I'm swinging off the chandelier in my office. Unfortunately, I basically work out of a closet for an office. Here's a stat that should alarm Canadians, every Canadian, which is that there are more hepatitis C and new hepatitis C infections in Canada every year than the number of people that are being treated, never mind being cured. Most people with hepatitis C are not being treated. Even if you look at 100 people who've been diagnosed, only 10 of those 100 have ever been attempted to be treated. And people are getting messed, they're falling through the cracks. The fact that there are new treatments that are coming that make treatment easier, that have higher cure rates, 
that it's easier to manage is fabulous. But if the barriers that exist to healthcare now aren't addressed, it's the, the impact of those new treatments is going to be far less than what it should be. And if we're talking about several hundred thousand people who are going to suffer this fate over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, we're really talking about an enormous health burden. When patients have diabetes, they're treated. When patients have cancer, they're treated. When patients have hepatitis C, they have to qualify for therapy. It just doesn't make sense. It's actually quite disturbing to me that the strategy is you can't qualify for funding for hepatitis C treatment until your liver is so damaged that it somehow becomes cost effective to do so. Our system of health care is not uh, really health care, it's sick care. We don't take care of people's health, we take care of them only when they get sick. So we wait for these people who are perfectly well and if I treat your hep C now and cure you, you're gonna have no complications of it ever. If I wait until you're sick from it, probably miss the boat and if I haven't missed the boat I'm gonna be dealing with incredibly intensive expensive therapies like liver transplant sure it might work for you but wow we can't transplant everybody who you know goes into liver failure especially when we've got a treatment that can cure you and never have you develop any symptom from this disease and never have you spend uh, all of these really expensive healthcare dollars down the road, either dying of liver failure, it's really expensive to die in a hospital, or to go on and have a liver transplant. There are very, very good reasons over and above delaying future costs to treat hepatitis C, namely the prevention of human suffering, of patients who would otherwise needlessly have to progress through liver damage because they're gonna have that much longer to live disease-free. If you're gonna treat hepatitis C, you want one kick at the can and you want your best shot. And in my opinion, the earlier the better. You know, I've heard some experts say that we can eradicate hepatitis C from our population in Canada over the next 30 years if we seriously um, focus on ensuring that people are diagnosed, monitored, and treated, and that we look after that prevention piece properly as well. This has the potential to actually cost a huge amount of money and devastate our healthcare system if we don't proactively do something about it now. What we're looking at is the tip of the iceberg. What is coming to the forefront now is the base of that iceberg, and it is huge. It's simple math, actually. When were most people infected with hepatitis C? Well, they were mostly infected in the 70s and early 80s. How long does it take for hepatitis C in a typical individual to damage the liver to the point where you have cirrhosis and are on the verge of liver failure? That takes about 30 to 35 years. So if you do the math, 1970 or 1980 plus 30, 35 years, we're, we're right there. Most of the people that we're seeing now for hepatitis C have cirrhosis and have early liver failure. So we're right there, we're right on the cusp of where it's gonna shoot up. Get tested. If you fall into those, that uh, baby boomer group 90, born before 1945, sorry, after 1945, before 1975, get tested. Better to know you have hepatitis C or don't have no hepatitis C than to be ignorant about it, because if you know, you can take steps to get something done about it. A simple blood test will do it, and if you are detected early on, there is the capacity to eradicate it, cure it, treat it, you know, live with it without having a liver transplant. There are methods that go through that might work for you as long as you catch it first. I think until people realize that it is a deadly, deadly disease and they can treat it before they get to the point where they need a transplant, who the hell wants a transplant? If you ignore the problem, you're gonna pay the price later. So 10 years from now, we're gonna see all those people who've fallen off the cliff and our hospitals are going to be full of people with liver disease. We are now going to be dealing with this problem when we should have been dealing with it all along. We're talking about decades of dealing with this if we don't get on top of it soon. It's like, you know that Edvard Munch painting, the, the scream? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm there a lot, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like, like Woody Allen says, I'm in 
nothing against death and dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens.